and call a spade a spade. So that's kind of what we do. And we also have a really good relationship with the Des Moines Waterworks. Um, they kind of have the same belief system that we do that the water is ours. It's not one person's, it's our water. It's all the people of Iowa's water. So why can corporate agriculture pollute it? And we have to suffer the consequences for it. And I think we kind of share that belief with Des Moines Waterworks. We've been working closely with them um, as they filed this lawsuit to make sure that we can have people like you all across the state who understand why the people are saying that enough is enough. And we also have to battle that narrative. Corporate agriculture is powerful. And I know what the news stories that you're hearing here in Sioux City are probably very different than what we're hearing in Des Moines. It's probably that mm. I've heard something that they are hearing that Bill Stowe is the devil. <laughs> it's not true. Wow. That's why we are here. It's because we want to make sure that everyone gets to hear the other side of the story. And that way, when there's a bad article, people can respond with the facts, the reality of why we are, why people are sick and tired of what's going on out there. So, with that said, I'd like to introduce Bill Stowe. Um, so proud to be able to work with him and be able to stand up the corporate agriculture together. So, Bill Stowe, directly to my audience. Thank you, Jess. Doesn't she do a great job? Yeah. Give her a round of applause. Uh, uh, I love coming to Sioux City. I see a couple old friends here. You guys may want to move dressed to your right, Michael, because I'm going to be, you and Carolyn may have a hard time seeing through my six foot four inch brain. If you want to try to rego there, that would be terrific. We weren't going to heckle. You weren't going to heckle. Well, you could heckle from over there. <laughs> If I get, if my voice gets too soft, using the back, uh, please raise your hand, and I'll be happy to modulate a little more. I'm used to working around heavy equipment, so I think I can project pretty well. Great to be here in Sioux City. Uh, beautiful day. Thank you for coming out. Thanks to ICCI, which I'm a member, the Sierra Club, and the Unitarian uh, Church here in Sioux City for having us. It's a pleasure to come to Northwest Iowa and be able to talk a little bit about water quality issues our lawsuit and really ultimately whatever you want to talk about that at least I can form an opinion on. Um, I'm going to talk about some science, I'm going to talk about some business, I'm going to talk about some public policy. I'll talk about our lawsuit a little bit, but what we're really talking about is environmental protection. And environmental protection in Iowa is different than environmental protection in our neighbors close to us here in Minnesota or not so close in Wisconsin, we as Iowans have a different view and have settled for a view of environmental protection that's far different than many others around us. What we hope to do, among other things, is to recalibrate uh, environmental protection as a real ethic in this state, particularly as it relates uh, to water quality. And I'm going to be talking about, really in two words, agricultural accountability. Agricultural accountability for the contribution of industrial agriculture to the degradation of our surface waters in Iowa. Three quick points. Um, I tell the 250 or so folks that I work with on a regular basis, we're not wa merely water producers and water distributors, we're public health professionals. If your drinking water is not safe, uh, your biology, your very existence is threatened by that and we don't have to go too far in news reports to remember Flint here pretty recently still in the news and for those of us who were in this business and remember discussions about 25 years ago Milwaukee and cryptosporidium another issue that happened about a public water supply water is a public health issue. Point number two we are surface water producers. We're not groundwater producers, and I'll talk a little bit about the difference between that, but probably fairly, off, uh, fairly obvious, like Sioux City, or like Iowa City, or like Davenport, or like most of the large cities in the United States, we draw our drinking water from rivers or lakes, rather than from uh, an aquifer. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means Ultimately, the easiest thing to remember about surface water production is the quality of surface water is driven by human intervention. It's not driven by geology. If you uh, sink a 3,000 foot well into the Jordan Aquifer, or if you're on the other side of the river into the Ogallala Aquifer, probably not nearly that deep, um, 
the water quality is driven more by geology. Does it have iron? Does it have manganese? What are the layers of rock that are impacting that? That's not the case in the water quality in the Missouri River or the Des Moines and Raccoon River where I'm from or for those of you who may have lived along the Mississippi River in eastern Iowa. It's driven by land activities and land activities in Iowa overwhelmingly means agriculture and industrial agriculture and we view that as the source of a need for agricultural accountability for what comes down the rivers to those of us who use it for surface water consumption. I also have to tell you for 15 years before I came into this job I worked for the Des Moines City Council and I have never been to a meeting and not been interrupted by a question or a heckler or whatever it may be. So please, we'll have some time at the end for some Q&As, but if you have a question or a concern about what I'm putting up as I go through it, stop and we'll talk about it. You know, I have family across the United States. I'm an Iowan like most of you, so I grew up in central Iowa, but I have family in California, I have family in Massachusetts, and they, if they weren't born here, they're family by marriage, they think of us as kind of one of these two pictures. For those of us who are more parochially central Iowans, this uh, gilded dome, gilded in more ways than one, uh, in Des Moines, uh, where I live and where I work, or they think of us as this Bob Evans kind of farm, this Norman Rockwell farm, this beautiful farm, um, and probably in my business, this is what I think about when I think of Iowa. I think of a green uh, cesspool of mess this time of the year that's called surface water. And those of you, and I know there are a number in the audience that have had experience with Iowa State University, great land grant school, great agronomists, they will tell you, our agronomists at Iowa State will say that our corn propensity in particular, as well as our bean propensity, is the largest single contributor to the reasons why that harmful algal bloom, that blue-green, that's not just green, that's blue-green. That's the same kind of thing that uh, creates toxins that close down the water system in the city of Toledo. We'll talk briefly about that in a few minutes. But that's industrial agriculture come to roost when it comes into surface waters. This time of year when it's particular war particularly warm, there's a microcystin, a toxin, that's created there that's far different than just some green sludge. That's poison. Water in the news. Wow, uh, water is very much in the news, whether we're talking about the Southwest and California, where it can be very dry, or here in the Midwest, where there are water quality issues, they're out and around. A few years ago, Charleston, uh, West Virginia, lost their water supply, surface water producers, because of a uh, coal cleaning chem a chemical that was spilled. Uh, a boil advisory was issued. Uh, I'm on a task force that's trying to restore the quality of water in Lake Erie. Uh, Lake Erie, as you may or may not know, is probably the greatest Great Lakes as it relates to uh, commercial fishing, surprisingly enough. You might think Superior or Michigan were the lakes for that. It's actually Lake Erie. Uh, Toledo and Cleveland on the shores of Lake Erie, hugely important uh, commercial fishing uh, a few years ago, they had one of these harmful algal blooms, these blue-green things that I just showed you, which actually was in Polk County in central Iowa, uh, that created a huge concern for them in not being able to use their public water source. And occasionally, you're going to hear your local water provider, particularly if you're in a smaller town, not so much in Sioux City, but if you're in Salix or Sloan or Brookings or whatever it may be, sometimes there'll be a, a, wa a water main that's broken and you'll hear about a boil advisory. Every time there's a water problem, you want to be listen to what they're saying. Boiling the water in some circumstances actually makes it worse. If it's bacterial, obviously, boiling it can kill that. If it's a nitrate concentration or a microcystin problem like we had in Toledo, boiling it actually concentrates it and makes it worse. So listen to what the water folks say when they say, do not drink, do not boil. Do not drink means do not drink. LA, I've got a lot of family on the West Coast, huge problems with you know, building a very populous state in a desert. Um, water quantity problems more than water quality problems are more of a concern for Californians. Governor Brown has really led forward, fortunately, with a number of measures to provide better water infrastructure. 
Des Moines Register now, a little over a year ago, uh, made very clear that a resurvey of the waters of the state show that they're more impaired now than ever before, and I'll talk about what that means in a, in a few minutes. Um, we've been involved in nitrate litigation. You're going to hear more about nitrate singular, not nitrates plural. I think nitrates plural is what I use for a heart condition, not what I'm concerned about in my drinking water, but hey, they're journalists. What the heck, cut them some slack. Um, here we go, they actually have it in singular form here. Nitrate is more than a concern for those of us in central Iowa. I know a number of you who I've talked with here in northwest Iowa are seeing problems also in your surface water and shallow wells, also a huge issue. And we'll talk a little bit about the hypoxic zone, the gulf and the connection of community through water. Ultimately our connection goes through New Orleans to the Gulf of Mexico where there's a larger dead zone because of nutrients because of nitrogen and phosphorus. And I'll even talk briefly, or other than briefly, if you prefer, about our litigation, which has us in Sioux City in about a year in front of a federal judge. Flint, we've heard a lot about Flint. Flint creates a lot of teaching points for those of us in my business. Uh, one of them is loss of local control. The state stepped into that and ended up fudging it up in a huge way. <coughs> criminal conspiracies to cover up data, but ultimately economic and social justice issues. An impoverished community that now is devastated by public health issues and a housing stock where who wants to go in and buy a lot of housing in Flint, Michigan, thinking that the water system itself may be in a horrible position. Quick 15 minutes, 15 seconds, not 15 minutes in our business, we serve water to 500,000 folks. Des Moines Waterworks is the name of our organization only because when we founded it, the Hubble family founded it around the Civil War, there was only Des Moines. Now there's a lot more than Des Moines. Most of the customers that I serve are in suburbs around Des Moines as opposed to in Des Moines. Uh, most of our facilities are in Des Moines in terms of water production. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but most of my customers are actually in suburbs in four counties, Polk County, obviously, which is where most folks live in central Iowa, but also now Dallas County growing very quickly, Madison and Warren counties to our south. We either retail or wholesale to a half million folks. Wow, and hydrous tanks, one of my favorite. We're gonna talk about uh, nitrate concentrations in a few minutes. I took that picture just a few weeks ago, actually around Kellogg, uh, you know, where Newton and Grinnell are just to our east. There's a lot of anhydrous sitting on the ground right there. Um, our system is large by Iowa standards. I told you we serve a half million folks. We have three treatment plants. The Fleur Drive plant, which is right next to Des Moines International Airport. I still scratch my head at that international. I'm not sure I know where there's an international flight. Uh, two going out of Des Moines, but I'm sure it must be accurate. Um, Chicago, yeah, well, I live in Chicago. That's another country in some ways. Um, three plants, one of them, very large one, Fleur Drive, right there in the middle of Des Moines. We have another one out kind of in the edge of our service territory down by Maffet Reservoir, not Moffat, uh, but by Maffet Reservoir down by Madison and Dallas County. Um, large reservoir there, and then we have another smaller plant but a different technology and I won't talk about the science of removing impurities very much but it's a reverse osmosis ultrafiltration plant uh, that sits up near Ankeny actually an unincorporated Sailor Township. We have the capacity to treat about 110 million gallons of water a day either from the Des Moines or Raccoon River and realistically it's from both rivers surface water producers again on a day like today, we'll sell 80 million gallons. So we sell a lot of water. We're a big water utility by Iowa standards at least. 1,400 miles of pipe or so. Again, I mentioned three treatment plants. We also have a really interesting technology this time of the year that we rely on pretty heavily. It's called an aquifer storage and recovery well. We have several of them. We treat water in the off season for us, which is January, where we don't have a lot of demand and pump it down 3,000 feet into the Jordan Aquifer, treat it, and then bring it up now when it, there is customer demand so we don't have to try to produce it on top of a peak. We're like an electric utility. I worked for Bit American Energy for a number of years, which is a summer peaking utility. You want to shave your peaks by storing, if you can, a lot more difficult to store electrons than it is, than it is to store water. We actually 
produce the water in January, pump it down into the aquifer and bring it back up and serve it uh, in June. So pretty interesting technology, but it's treated six months before it's served up. Kind of an interesting process. Ah, I love this from Brushy Creek. Anybody here from Carroll County? Harry the Hereford, right in the middle of Brushy Creek, a tributary to a delightful Raccoon River, for those of you who know that area. He's there to do more than mm, cool his feet or his hooves, as it were, I'm pretty confident. Another contributor to our water quality issues that we have in Iowa. If you go to Minnesota or Wisconsin, uh, some pretty strict regulations to keep livestock out of surface water, as an example, but not in Iowa. You heard Jess mentioned, and you probably saw on the uh, slide that kind of started us here, that I believe we're in a water quality, not quantity, quality crisis in Iowa. I point to three things last year, and we'll have more data as this summer goes on that take me there. One of them are the number of beach closures we had in Iowa last summer was a record because of issues like the HABs, the harmful algal blooms you saw, but also just bacteria in the water that make it unsafe for you and I to go swimming. I frankly don't even think about swimming in most surface waters in Iowa. If I want a good swim, I'll get on a jet and go to the, one of the coasts or get in somebody's chlorinated pool. Um, but a lot of folks that I serve, as an example, don't have the economic means to be able to do that. They would love to go jump at Gray's Lake, as an example, right across from where my offices are, or a Quabby. Uh, in Warren County to our south or um, Sailorville just to our north. Unfortunately, it's often unsafe this time of the year because of the amount of either algae in it or bacteria. So a uh, record number of beach closures last year, also a record number of impaired waterways. And impaired waterways are rivers or streams or lakes that violate a public health standard. It basically says it's unfishable and unsw or unswimmable, one of the two. We have a record number of pieces of our waterways in this state now that are impaired under public health standards than ever before. And finally, what is a very specific metric to us in central Iowa, um, not so much to water producers, particularly in this part of our state, is we had to denitrify. We had to remove nitrate concentrations from our water supply for 177 days, basically half the days last year. The record before that was 109 days, so huge amounts of nitrate concentrations coming down both of our rivers and putting us into a situation where we had to remove it, and I'll talk about that removal process a little bit here in a few minutes. And all this kind of aggregately goes into the Mississippi River Valley the size of the Gulf hypoxic area, an area where marine life, simply because of over-nutrification, can't survive, is larger uh, than the states of Connecticut and Rhode Island put together. So a huge concern for us as an American community, or an international community, at least as it relates to Mexico, in the Gulf. In my business, and in the business of your local water treatment, companies, whomever that may be, and in Iowa, overwhelmingly likely to be a public entity like we are. When we take surface water from a lake or a river or a stream, we're concerned in Iowa about three different things. One of them are suspended solids. You go down and look at the Floyd River, the Missouri River, the Raccoon River, and it looks more like cappuccino than it does water. It has, it's brown. And you let it set for a few minutes and it'll settle out. Suspended solids. Not a huge issue in conventional water treatment because we have a way to coagulate that out, to drop it out in the process. A concern that you probably think about uh, with more rigorousness because it can make you sick are microbiological stuff that's in that water, bacteria, protozoa as an example, fungi, whatever it may be. Our conventional treatment also does a pretty good job of taking that out. Conventional treatment for us is something called lime softening. Anybody here heard of lime softening? Yeah, a couple of the water folks have. Lime softening is kind of the gold standard of how surface water is treated. You put in lime and a coagulant and you use sand filters and it takes out almost everything and then you throw in a little chlorine and it kills whatever is left uh, that's a problem. Very successful and it's been around for 200 years. Used by the English in London in the 1840s and transferred here now and used uh, regularly. 
What that treatment process called lime softening does not do is to remove nutrients. Nutrients are fertilizers, essentially. Nitrogen and phosphorus are the primary ones. Uh, manganese is another one as an example, but nitrogen and phosphorus are the ones that really plague us as Midwesterners because of our row crop farming and our animal feeding operations in particular. Cannot be taken out by this process I've called this lime softening. We have to remove it in a different way. One of these treatment plants that we have has ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, uses four or five times the amount of electricity as a regular treatment plant to use filters about the width and length of my hair to literally filter out uh, things that are of molecular size like a molecule called NO3, nitrate. It's able to filter that out. Expensive, difficult, slows down the process. We also use a process <laughs> called ionization at our lime softening facilities that use positive and negative valence electrons to suck out nitrogen, and particularly nitrate concentrations. It's expensive, it's slow, um, and it has the risk factors. There are a number of other things that you think about when you think about surface water and Iowa that aren't really a big issue for us. Um, atrazine, uh, glyphosate, uh, Roundup. Um, pharmaceuticals are an area that are of growing concern to us. I look around the room at this age cohort and probably three quarters of us take a daily medication. That's going through our system through a wastewater treatment plant and ultimately into the surface waters of the state. Those really aren't the issues that concern me. In a state with 21 million hogs, uh, I'm more concerned about antibiotics in animals than I, than I am in humans. So a concern for us because that's when you hear about superbugs and antibiotic resistant bacteria, the more exposure, um, the more likely it is that there will be immunities that develop in that. So uh, an issue for us, but not one that's been regulated so far, interesting. And neither, interestingly enough, has the microsystems that I've been talking about, the blue-green algae. The science hasn't caught up with us yet to tell us what to do. We're very concerned about that and look at it every day and have some activated carbon kind of processes to take them out. Um, but our regulators haven't told us what the right prescription is to dial in to be able to make that work. We're just very concerned about making folks sick and realistically, um, it is not a very aesthetic problem to have some kind of algae in this. You will not like its smell in particular. Not that you like chlorine smell a whole lot either, I'm gonna bet. Let me talk about nitrate concentrations because it really is the focus of our lawsuit in terms of the pollutant, but the issues in our lawsuit are bigger than that. Nitrate, NO3, um, is essentially a form of fertilizer. Typically, it's anhydrous ammonia or manure that through a process of mineralization makes it into soluble water, into a soluble source, a water source that we have to deal with. It is a public health concern because at 10 or more parts per million, it creates significant risk to the very young. There's emerging science that says it may be the older that have some kind of compromised immunal issue. But we, like Sioux City, are a regional medical provider. We have a lot of neonatal stuff going on in hospitals in our community. So we have every interest in keeping our nitrate concentrations delivered to our hospital customers, as an example low. That is very difficult for us to do, unfortunately, given the nitrate concentrations in the rivers. Let me talk about why that's the case for a minute. Um, pretty good map. If you can see in the 1850s, we were basically a grass prairie state, right? With a little forestation around the waterways, around the creek banks and river banks. Um, this is what we look like a lot more recently. We've changed the topography, changed the biology essentially of our state radically and now we're a row crop farm state. I have the pleasure of talking to folks outside of Iowa who may fly over this state when they go from you know Chicago to LA or may drive through when they're going skiing in Denver and I uh, tell them Iowa is I owe wildlife an apology as an Iowan because we have denuded this state. We have very little forestation and very little natural habitat. We have very little bio uh, diversity. We've changed the state so radically that it has had environmental impacts that I'm going to talk about, it, particularly in the area of geohydrology. 
the state of Iowa, gosh, you're Northwestern Iowans, you will appreciate this. The state of Iowa really is the state of nitrogen. Huge anhydrous plant being built to our south here. A lot of discussion about uh, hog facilities in particular. <coughs> We've mentioned that we have 21 million hogs in Iowa, 3 million people. What are we really concerned about making sure that the weight is, waste is treated and handled? The human waste of 3 million folks. Hogs, 21 million, not nearly as concerned about. And I think the multiplier uh, per animal unit of hog to people is about six. So the 21 million hogs, you can do the math, is a far greater um, provider of waste and manure than three million people. Interesting map here, I think, of the concentration of animal feeding operations in your area of the state and just to the north area of the state from where I live and work. Uh, here, a pretty good color coding of something called the Des Moines lobe. The Des Moines lobe, a little hydrogeology here. The Des Moines lobe is an area uh, in north central and central Iowa that was glaciated only about 15,000 years ago. Glaciers come down through Canada, through Minnesota, through northern Iowa and stop in Des Moines. Uh, the terminal moraine, the tip of that <coughs> movement of ice south is Des Moines. Our capital, our state capital, is built on that moraine. The hydrogeology changes very radically from Polk County into Warren County. That area of the state that was glaciated just 15,000 years ago is swamp, naturally. It's the area of the state, obviously, just to the east of you in Sac County as an example. Uh, and in Polk County, where I'm from, or Story County, where I'm really from, by birth, um, that area of the state for it to be productive in raising corn has to be tiled. Water has to be removed from those soils or they're not very successful at raising corn and soybeans. We're going to talk about that tiling system in the context of our lawsuit. Because it used to be great for ducks and geese. Used to be prairie potholes, marsh, swamp, whatever we want to call it. It is naturally great for ducks and geese. And now it's great for row crops, uh, for corn in particular, but only because it has to be drained. Rich soil doesn't do well. Corn doesn't do well with wet feed. Interesting number there out of Barron now about a year ago about the exponential increase in confinement uh, animal livestock as opposed to, I remember when, you know, hogs were really in pastures once upon a time. Not just cattle, but hogs and cattle and chickens and other stuff. Now I drive to the area that I grew up in and they're all in sheds and all fed lots of antibiotics. Wow, new hog plan, Boone or Bain. You guys are all too familiar with that as Northern Iowans. We have a huge emphasis on economic development in creating more nitrogen opportunities in this state, which I believe create more problems for our watersheds. A uh, couple examples, CF Industries, one that you're going to be very familiar with here. Uh, Oriscom, which is in southeastern Iowa, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in economic incentives given to create facilities that may or may not create good jobs. They certainly create jobs. The construction jobs are good jobs, and the ultimate jobs may not be so good, or are not, in my view, so good, but they do create nitrogen, lots of nitrogen, whether it's anhydrous, in the case of CF Industries or Oriscom, or whether it's like the packing plants themselves, manure, which is another form of nitrogen, all of which ultimately contribute to our water quality problems in the state. We're unique. I talked about the Des Moines lobe uh, earlier. Gosh, I thought I'd change this to Central Iowa is unique instead of Des Moines. Our river valleys um, are the Des Moines lobe. Des Moines River. Um, watershed extends into southern Minnesota, the Raccoon River watershed. Here in western and, and northwest Iowa, we draw water from both of those rivers and really need to because of the size of the population. We serve, I assume you know what this is. This is field tile. Um, and it's often, I, I, I talk with a lot of people in urban suburban Des Moines, and most of us, you know, are only one or two generations away from being farmers if we're. Iowans uh, by birth, but a lot of folks who I talk with in the western suburbs have just moved here from New Jersey or Seattle or Texas and don't have the slightest idea what field tiling is. If you look at the inset to the lower left, you see a, a just emerging corn, beautiful black soil, about a meter beneath that. That is about the height of uh, this 
stand beneath the surface are field tiles and they're usually flexible now they were ceramic when they were called tiles and I was a kid now it's flexible but it moves water from the root zone of that corn laterally over into the waters of the state that interrupts the natural treatment process of the soil mantle takes more water and lesser quality water over quickly into the waters of the state which create significant concerns for us downstream as you and can you imagine. And you don't recharge groundwater because of That's water correct. Removed. You do not recharge groundwater. The aquifers are <coughs> recharged really by two sources. One of them is precipitation. The original charging of the aquifers was by glaciation. I don't know about you, but I don't intend to be around for the next ice age. So I've got to rely on something other than that to recharge aquifers. We all know that groundwater the aquifers in the state are actually being depleted and that's certainly more so the case as you move into the southwest. Hence the cities, most of our cities and certainly my city draws water from sustainable surface water. That water when it rains here or rains I should say in the Raccoon River Valley not here in the Sioux Valley but it rains in the Raccoon River Valley day one about day three it comes to us through sustainable surface water. Um, aquifers are a whole different deal. It takes thousands of years to recharge aquifers and we're drawing them down. Hence, even if we wanted to, uh, not probably sustainable or smart for us to go to groundwater to get away from the polluted surface waters of the state because we use 70 million gallons today. That's a huge hit on the Jordan Aquifer, particularly in the local aquifers. Drainage districts. Drainage districts are the utilities, the public utilities, that take private pipes underneath those fields, put them together in a public system that ultimately drain into the waters of the state of Iowa. Drainage districts were created now about a hundred, a little over a hundred years ago by state law. They give the county boards of supervisors, whether it's here in Woodbury County or where I am in Polk County, the ability to be able to levy assessments against the benefited areas, the farmers within the geography that drains there to be able to create improvements like the piping systems, the culverts, the ditches, the channels, whatever it may be. You can tell that the topography of the state and the soil types of the state have drainage districts overwhelmingly in the Des Moines lobe. A little bit of an exception over here where we see along the Missouri River just to our south here as we were driving up, we were noting it, um, drainage districts. But if you're from Johnson County or Lee County or Pottawatomie County, probably, unless you're right on the river, um, you don't know what a drainage district is. They are a very prevalent force in the world of agriculture, industrial agriculture in north and north central Iowa. That is not Mars. That is Hardin County, just to the north of the metro area, and a look at the artificial hydrogeology of drainage districts. Think what that does to the natural flow of water, the ability to recharge aquifers, and the natural biology of soils. It changes it entirely. Again, bringing more water into the waters of this state with less water quality, more nitrates, more nutrients. Um, more bacterial pollutants. Why are we unique? Again, because of our soils in central Iowa and north central Iowa in particular. There are three other areas where these drainage districts are really prevalent. Central Iowa, you see, but also east uh, central Illinois around Champaign-Urbana. I'm an Illinois graduate, so I've spent a little time there. The city of Champaign-Urbana uses aquifer water. They've given up on trying to use surface waters. The other areas around Lake Erie, which we've talked about, actually that area of Ohio and Indiana, the water flows to the northeast into Lake Erie as opposed into the Mississippi River Valley, heavily tiled also. Significant water quality problems. But another great shot, that one's from Illinois, about uh, putting ammonia and hydrous would be a form of ammonia. NH3 onto the soil pretty quickly changes to nitrate and then is immediately mainlined right into the waters of the state of Illinois, in that case, the surface waters. Let me talk about our lawsuit because we've kind of been hinting around about it. Uh, our two water sheds, the Des Moines and Raccoon River. Uh, we prefer to take our water from the Raccoon River because our two big plants, you probably didn't notice it in the map earlier, I didn't emphasize for you to notice it, are on the Raccoon River rather than the Des Moines River. 
So we prefer, for economic reasons, to use the Raccoon River rather than the Des Moines River. About two years ago, two and a half years ago, we started a process of going up and testing these discharge points, just like you saw in the previous pictures about uh, drainage districts and discharging into the waters of the state. We found several around Sac City that were entirely agriculture. There wasn't a municipal golf course that was connected to it. There wasn't a wastewater treatment plant that was connected to it. There wasn't uh, suburban yards or urban parks associated with their ag, industrial ag. We went and tested them every day for a year and found that the nitrate concentrations coming out of those pipes were three and four times a public health standard. So a huge concern for us. We named the boards of supervisors in Sac County and Buena Vista in a Calhoun County as defendants in our lawsuit, saying essentially they violated the Clean Water Act by not supervising, not managing drainage districts in a way that gave some protection for <coughs> downstream water users like us, like the people that I represent. Why Sac County? Uh, three or four pretty practical reasons. One is in Sac City there's the United States Geological Survey real-time gauge. You could, if you had a smartphone and had the right address, right now go to it and it'll tell you what the nitrate level is on the Raccoon River in Sac County through U.S. government testing right there, right now. So when we have test results coming from these tributaries, if you will, into that area, we have it validated by the U.S. government essentially. So that's one reason that we chose it. All industrial ag, another reason. Another reason is that we had ready uh, right away access to the points that we tested right off Highway 20. Many of you probably know Highway 20 uh, in Sac County area. The reason that uh, Buena Vista and Calhoun were brought in, drainage districts are really based on surface topography. Uh, a township or two in each of those neighboring counties were part of a drainage district that essentially was in Sac County. That's why they were named in the lawsuit also. But we're essentially saying that those boards of supervisors failed to protect us downstream, violated the Federal Clean Water Act, and also violated state law. The state of Iowa says the rivers, streams, surface waters of this state are the commonwealth of all of us, not of a farmer, not of a general manager of a water utility, not of whomever owns the adjacent uh, property. We all own it, and so if somebody destroys it, it's a nuisance, a trespass, and inverse condemnation. A big word meaning it's been illegally taken without compensating us. So we've got state law and federal claims. Sir, there's my question. Yeah, not, not to get you too far off track, but can you give us some examples from around the country? I'm thinking of California, yeah. probably the most sensitive environmental state right. in the union. Um, do they not rely on it? surface water for drinking purposes or I mean we know there's their water is short and we say quantities right. the problem out there rather than quality. But other than California, have there been non point have there been non point arguments in the past that, 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 that this is going to become great question and without wading into it too deeply, California just a weird state in a number of different ways. <laughs> um, you know essentially what they're doing is they're moving surface water from the north to the south, basically mountain uh, snow melt off from the north to the south, diverting some water from far eastern California to LA and Orange County as an example. So they use a lot of surface water. They also have groundwater concerns. And if you have family in central California and they talk about concerns with the aquifer there, it's because of groundwater issues. But the long and short of all that is that California has very strict agricultural regulations and agricultural accountability for what comes out of their system into the waters of the state of California. Those are the kinds of things that we're arguing for here in Iowa. You know, we hear a lot about Iowa feeds the world. Well, California does a lot more feeding of the world than Iowa does. I feed my gas tank when I buy ethanol off of Iowa corn, uh, but when I have the wonderful food that was over here, particularly the greenery, a little while ago, most of that's from California. So my point is that you can have successful agriculture in a regulated environment where there's agricultural accountability in a successful farm state. We just have not chosen that. We've chosen to accept that the Missouri River should look like this, or the Floyd River should look like that, or the Little Sioux should look like it does. 
Uh, in Wisconsin, as an example, people would heave at the idea that that was acceptable just by its appearance, let alone by the chemistry underlying that. That's kind of the vision that we're trying to move to. I grew up in Michigan uh, between Monroe and Toledo, about six miles from Lake Erie. And we could almost never swim in Lake Erie. And at that point, the country had chosen to allow people along the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland yep. to put so much crap in there that it's gone on fire several times a year. And hence, eventually, the Clean Water Act for that and, very and, reason. And therefore, people who forget that think that the EPA is, EPA is troublesome, that's what cleaned up the Cuyahoga River. Absolutely. Um, and out of crisis comes opportunity and, and comes improvement. And now we think that we have a crisis here in Iowa that's going to have to be dealt with. Let me hit on a few more issues and then I'm going to turn over the lectern and or at least try to answer a couple of questions. You know, is it unusual? Is it because of a lot of rain? We hear it from industrial agriculture regularly. It's geese, it's Martians, it's Mother Nature <laughs> that creates nitrate concentrations. It's the soils. Well, there's a little bit of truth in all that, but when you aggregate it all together, industrial agriculture and hydrus and manures are what are causing our nitrate and phosphorus concerns in the state. To give you some idea of the longitudinal look, we at Waterworks, at Des Moines Waterworks, have looked at nitrate concentrations in the raccoon since 1974. We've looked at it in the Des Moines River since 82. We have a lot of longitudinal data. Um, this shows you some of the longitudinal emphasis that we're talking about here. And basically, what it's saying is 15 and 16 are about as bad as it's gotten in our history. And we've had an unusual year. This year, last year was unusual. What is usual weather anyway? We're not even talking about climate change, other than to recognize that is a reality that in my business we have to be concerned about. These are phenomenon. These are water crisis, water quality crisis data points that have to do with the evolution of industrial agriculture, not merely mother nature or goose poop or Martians. Uh, we are having a change in our basic <coughs> system of agriculture that's having an impact on those of us downstream who are consumers. I want to talk one more minute about the community aspects of water. Uh, the Gulf Coast hypoxia is real. It's like climate change. It is real. There isn't a lot of data and a lot of argumentation in the science community that would indicate that we are not poisoning the waters of, of the Gulf Coast through over nutrification. <laughs> Pretty good uh, sense. The Mississippi River Valley is huge, as you can imagine, going all the way to Montana, as you know, and all the way, you know, essentially uh, into portions of Ohio, at least. This gives you a sense of what the contributions are of varying states. We are a huge contributor on the nitrogen side. Phosphorus, not quite so bad. That's because we're getting a little bit better about soil conservation issues. Nitrogen travels with water. Phosphorus travels with soil. Uh, a little bit of an oversimplification, but Iowa, huge concern in terms of nitrification. These are how we remove, this is the ionization process that we use positive and negative electrons to be able to remove uh, nitrate concentrations from treated water. Um, any year, this is from 95 forward, we're above the axis, we're having to do something special. It means more than 10 parts per million. That's the regulatory requirement is in our surface waters. We're having to do something for all of these days that we're above zero. And there are a lot of things that we have to do. Uh, the nitrification units you saw was one of them. Heard an earlier discussion about wetlands. We're also constructing treatment wetlands right now to be able to provide an alternate technology for us. This is pretty expensive, has some environmental concerns for us also, but the real point is our surface waters have too much fertilizer in them when they come to us downstream. Um, we've gone through a very lengthy year and a half uh, analysis with engineering staff, international engineering staff, who are subject matter experts in nutrification issues, and what they're telling us is you think it's bad now, it's going to get worse. The Raccoon River will hit 30 parts per million and the Des Moines River will hit 25 parts per million. We as a utility, like an electric utility, don't uh, treat water for averages. We treat them for peaks. You don't want to be without electricity on a really hot day when there's peak demand. You don't want to be without water on a day when it just so happens there's a lot of nitrate out there in the rivers. So we have to build facilities to be able to accommodate projected peaks. We're going to spend $80 million to better denitrify if we don't 
succeed in our lawsuit very quickly and those facilities will cost us a million and a third or so each year just to be able to put people and chemicals and electricity through it. The nutrient reduction strategy, I'm going to touch on that for just a second. It is the watchword for Iowa's current understanding of why we're sending too many nutrients down the rivers. Um, about 10 years ago now, the US EPA said to all of the states in the Mississippi River Valley, get together and come up with a way to reduce nutrients. Iowa did that. Uh, Bill Northey, Governor Branstad, uh, Iowa State, the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship announced a policy and a study about three years ago now that essentially says this 90% of the nutrient problem, the nitrogen problem, comes from agriculture, 10% from sewage treatment facilities, golf courses, municipal storm sewer systems, whatever it may be. What do we regulate in the state? 10%. What do we leave unregulated? 90%. Why do we think it's getting worse? Uh, because we are leaving unregulated the 90%. The policy consideration is that we will, through voluntary conservation practices, reduce our nitrate um, contributions into the Mississippi River Valley by 45 percent. Now it's like me kind of listening to my doctor and saying, yeah, I can lose 45 percent of my body weight. I can lose almost 100 percent of my body weight at death and plus 10 years, but without a schedule and without accountability and without metrics and, about, and without resources to be able to do that, that's not going to happen. I can say, yeah, I'll lose 45 percent of my body weight, and I'm 100 percent confident that at some point I will lose 45% of my body weight. But it's not on the right schedule, it's not with the right resources, it's not for the right, right reason. So we have a really bad series of public policy issues here that is driving us towards more water quality crisis. Enough on that, I keep hearing from our political leaders, both parties, that we need more time. We didn't get into this overnight, we're not going to get out of it overnight. Well. We built the world's largest nitrate removal facility, the picture you saw earlier in the 1990s, because we violated the standard. We really understand that it's been around for a while, um, but you're thirsty every day. The area of the state that I'm from is using more water regularly every day. We have to deal with the issue now and cannot wait generations to deal with it. It's past due. To talk about wasted resources and other public policy issue, a lot of USDA money put out, your tax money put out into industrial agriculture for more production slash more uh, pollution, not a tie between uh, USDA money and environmental protection, a huge public policy skip in our view. There are things that can be done and essentially it's this, within those fields there in-field issues and edge-of-field issues that will create a reduced nitrogen in particular coming out of the fields. Within the fields you can use stabilizers, have a different crop rotation, use cover crops or a few edge-of-field issues, wetlands, bioreactors, but we have 22 or 3 million acres in this state of row crops. We have maybe 20 million dollars of state money going into those. 22 or 23 million acres. We are horribly underfunded to be able to provide real environmental protection and real environmental Im improvement. That is a picture from beautiful Sac County and if you think that's natural hydrology, well, uh, let's talk. Um, but that is a great example of how hydrology has changed, how there's an interruption of the natural biology of soils moving it laterally quickly interrupting recharge into the waters of the state. That water is coming to us far quicker for flood protection purposes in a city that's at the confluence of two rivers, um, but also creating significant drinking water concerns for us. That's why we sued it. No other business can take a pipe from its business to the waters of the state and not be regulated. Agriculture can. Big issue in our lawsuit. Uh, some basic principles we have we believe that from a policy standpoint, treating pollution at its source, that is at the fields or at the edge of the fields rather than 100 miles downstream is more economic. We believe that those are point source dischargers like any pipe, like a storm sewer pipe is out here on Jackson is an example. That's regulated, I promise you. Um, we believe ultimately agricultural accountability. 
the idea of sustainable agriculture and taking the costs of production and putting them on the producer polluter as opposed to consumers downstream who use water is an appropriate policy end. And uh, we're dealing with some pretty difficult people. This delightful quote from the newly elected president of the American Farm Bureau kind of says it all. Wow, uh, clean air, clean water, environmental protection is an infringement of private property rights. I should be able to do whatever I damn well please on my farm, period. Well, um, there are people like us who do not think that that is appropriate public policy, nor is it the law of the United States. And we'll hold fee people accountable who believe that because we are suffering the consequences downstream from that kind of belief. Enough. There are bumper stickers like this in the back. I'm not a real bumper sticker person, but if you are, and I do have one of these on my car, grab one, put it on your car. We believe that clean water is an essential uh, for our biology and for our economic development, for our recreation in this state. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to recreate in the waters of this state? There's a little of that goes on, but certainly not what we'd like to see. Let me uh, take a few questions before I turn over uh, the lecture. Ma'am. I'll be happy to repeat the question. The question is, how do we denitrify, basically, and what do we do with the nutrients that we take out? Um, yeah, and I don't want to get too much into the science, but imagine the periodic chart of the elements, and I know there's some scientists in here. You can find an element, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, if it's on the periodic chart of the element, there's something called mass balancing. You don't, you know, it's not bewitched, you don't wiggle your nose and it goes away. Uh, when it's in the water system, it's soluble nitrogen. There aren't a lot of things we can do other than raise crops, which we can't do. We don't have, you know, uh, X hundreds of thousands of acres on our property to be able to use the nutrients to be able to do that. The other thing that you can do and that we do do is, um, to use a biological process to gasify nitrogen, to release it, you know, little bacteria that eat it and then blow it into the air. We reduce through uh, a process, a gallery process, a process. If you go into Waterworks Park, you're gonna see a whole bunch of lakes and we have a whole bunch of gravel pits as an example that we own around Polk County and into Madison County where we use limnology, the science of lakes and the biology of that and wetlands is an example to be able to gasify that through a biological process. Um, but we also have a whole chunk of that nitrogen that we just don't have any other method than through a permit, through an NPDES permit, through our regulators to be able to return it to the Raccoon River. We're in the process of putting that into the sewer system that will use a biological process to be able to eat that up. But that's expensive and it falls on our ratepayers. But again, the whole point is that when you introduce uh, manure or anhydrous ammonia into the water cycle as nitrogen, you're creating um, an environmental issue there that's not easily dealt with unless you are fertilizing plants or you have a biological system like sewage treatment facilities are that will gasify that, will, that will take it and release it. Nitrogen doesn't, doesn't disappear, it changes form. Sir? I'll get you, Michael. I saw your hand over there. Follow up on what happens to nitrates after you all extract them. Mm -hmm. uh, had you thought about setting up uh, ancillary businesses, say, to make ping pong balls or uh, to sell Or fertilizer, it, perhaps. Or, or, <laughs> Take or it and sell it. this fertilizer and sell it to people in Sac County. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, or or uh, as uh, sell it off to explosive companies. Or Which is where it came from originally, as you know. Let me talk a little bit about that. Yeah, there, are there commercial things that we could do with the nitrogen? Um, uh, the easy answer is no, because the ionization process, this positive and negative electron system that I talked about, we use salt to be able to coal the nitrogen out, and that you don't mix salt and fertilizer together and put it on plants. It is worse for them than you can imagine. We've tried it. We've done some experimental things with that, and. We ended up with a lot of dead grass, a lot of dead corn, and a lot of dead oak trees, unfortunately. But the process of removing nitrate in a meaningful way is very difficult. Once it's soluble in that form, very difficult. Michael. How much more time do I have, Jess? Well, 
I've got at least one for Michael, I promise you. Five, Got it. Minutes? Five minutes. Uh, <coughs> any friends of what you're trying to accomplish at the state or federal level? Not enough, that's for sure. And that's part of the reason that we're in the circuit out here talking with folks. Uh, the question is, do we have any friends for our position at the state or federal level? There certainly are some friends at the state level, but realistically there are some friends at the federal level. The US EPA is not a friend. The governor and frankly the USDA secretary, our director, uh, are not friends of our particular position here. So there aren't enough friends, that's for sure. Um, but we're not running for homecoming king. We're trying to protect the interests of 500,000 central islands. And we're gonna do that without regard to whether we make a lot of friends or not. We've certainly made some interesting enemies, let me put it that way. Sir? The name we've collected, have, have the, has the other side had complaints about that? What, what I've heard is a lot of, you're, we're farmers and you're going to kill us, not really saying that any of the points you're trying to make aren't true. We just, great question. The just don't like the ha, Has anybody questioned our data? The easy answer is no, and let me give you the real inside reason why it's no. We split half of our samples and sent them to the Iowa Soybean Association and said, we've got some samples here we want you to test. They confirmed our data without knowing what we were going to use the data for, obviously. Um, nobody's challenged our data because the ag groups themselves tested it and verified it. So our data is beyond reproach. They, think, they may think that we're goofy Sierra Club, you know, tree huggers because we want to uh, put industrial agriculture into the dark ages and kill the world, but the basic issue that these drainage tiles are discharging 40 parts per million of nitrogen into the waters of the state uh, can be questioned because their own commodity group verified the very data that we collected. Can you give us an update on the lawsuit? Update on the lawsuit. A year from now, that is uh, June 28th, we're going to be in federal court here in Sioux City on the clean water claims. That's the claim that that pipe is a point source and should be regulated despite the fact that EPA hasn't regulated for 40 years or the DNR hasn't regulated for 40 years. So in a year, we'll be here arguing that in fr front of a federal judge. We have a number of state claims on nuisance and, and trespass and inverse condemnation that are in front of the Iowa Supreme Court now. The cases were kind of split in a way that had state claims going to a state court, federal claims going to a federal court. Um, the state claims are a little bit squishier as to when that'll happen. We're hoping that'll happen this fall. Michael, I'll get you and I'll be right back to you, man. Michael? No. no. Good? Um, several points. Um, Robert Kennedy Jr. was here a couple of years ago talking about the fact that a lot of the hog farms did not, were not following the law, was, was concerned with how they were treating they didn't have any way of treating them or they were just spreading on the field, which is not correct or legal. And if there was some way to make that so they would be accountable. And two, how do you, how do you, um, what do you suggest for the tiling? I mean, the tiling's in place. There's no way to undo all that tiling. Great question. So how do you, Great you question. can't pull it. I mean, it's there. It's Great there. question. The, the basic question is, what are you suggesting really should happen? Yeah. And on the, on the AFO CAFO issue, the animal feeding operation issues, you know, we believe that, first of all, the current matrix that has us um, essentially looking at each request individually without a concern about what's happening statewide is ridiculous. We have 21 million hogs here. How many more hogs do we need before we're like North Carolina and say, time out? There's no environmental basis for continuing to have more livestock. Is that our view of the state? Is that our vision of the state? Is this a feeding lot between the Missouri and Mississippi rivers? If so, that's where we're heading. Because, you know, and if that's where we are, that's where we are. Um, that's not our vision, obviously. The other part of that question is, okay, tile discharge points. Think of the Sac County picture here. What do you, I'll get you a clearer one. What do you think should happen there? Well, what we think should happen there is that should be permitted just like the municipal storm sewer system is here in Sioux City. And there should be a permit for that that says either there are narrative or numeric requirements of what comes out of that. Meaning, I look at that and I say, that's a treatment point. I can put a biofilter on that. 
I can do things behind it to make sure there isn't as much nitrogen coming through that pipe, like stabilizing, like cover crops, uh, like a different rotation of crops. Frankly, as a water professional, I don't care what they do upstream from that, so long as what comes out of that pipe is less than 10 milligrams per liter. That's what I care about. Uh, I'm not gonna, one size doesn't fit all, as and the American Farm you, Bureau how says. How do you do that? Like with each one of we'll these? say the drainage district yeah, holds the permit for that. The Board of Supervisors in Sac County ho holds the permit for that. They're responsible for what coming out of that pipe not being more than 10 milligrams per liter. How they accomplish, it, how they accomplish that, that's their issue. Okay. There are lots of, again, suggestions on how that could happen. What makes most sense there? I have the slightest idea. I don't care. As a water professional, I care about the pollutants coming out of the pipe. Right. Sir? Um, has there been any particular interest or assistance by the counties, uh, SAC, and Polk, uh, public health agencies? Yes. And Great question. By, uh, since Iowa Public Health Association is located in the world, whether they would be sensitive. Is there any kind of connection or support? The basic question is, has the public health community stepped into this? And you'll notice I kicked it off by talking about water being a public health commodity and we being the public health providers. Yes is the simple answer to your question. Uh, there are a number of folks at the state level and at the University of Iowa in particular that are being very supportive of us in providing the public health argument necessary to make that work. But a great question. Ma'am? On that question about what to do when you I think the farmers aren't dumb farmers. They actually know they won't do it until they're forced to do it. I didn't mean to imply they're dumb. They're not no, dumb. They're a lot smarter than I am. That. But frankly, they don't tell me how to treat my water. I'm not going to tell them how to farm. But you're right. There are things. Those farmers know because that's their land. I mean, they know from time. Well, and they also know within a drainage district who the good ones are and who the bad ones are and who should be weaned on and how that should work. But again, frankly, um, I don't view that any different than a mid-American energy uh, stack down the road here. There are all point source polluters. As a nation, we've stepped in and had specific requirements about what can come out of that stack in Sergeant's Bluff. We should have that same kind of requirement there, just like we do on the tailpipe of your car, is uh, the muffler of your car, where you have a catalytic converter. How many of you volunteered to get a catalytic converter? Yeah. Oh, never mind. Or maybe volunteered to use unleaded gas. Oh, nobody did that. Yeah. We have it there to protect a national interest. Sir? If you had one uh, conservation practice that you just thought was the biggest impact, what was the first thing you, you would do? You know, uh, and not being a farmer and recognizing that farmers are smarter than me, I'm a big believer in cover crops, but whenever I talk to people um, in my family, they say, oh, it costs us $55 an, an acre to put in cover crops. Oh, oh, okay, well, it costs my ratepayers $80 million to clean it up. <laughs> So I don't care about your $55 million or your $55 an acre. Realistically, that's a cost of production. But I'm a believer that the way to deal with too many nutrients is to round out the growing season. You know, we have a growing season that's basically five months. We have nitrogen in those soils, and the results of over nitrification for another seven months and cover crops. I also hear, well, you know, we're in pretty frosty country and. Woodbury County or in Mills County, not so much in Mills County, I'll, uh, in uh, Powashik County. Uh, our friends in Minnesota have, use a cover crops on a regular basis. They're a lot further north than we are. Is the EPA yeah. going to help you on this? And is this going to become a national issue? Because I think it should. Uh, to some degree, it's a national issue already in terms of the idea that industrial ag is being challenged by a rear guard action in their own state, not Robert Kennedy junior or whomever it may be. It's being done by a water utility in the capital city. So there's some attention to that. The EPA realistically is not a help to us because for 40 years they've said agriculture is exempt. Uh, we don't buy that. Um, but they also have not been a hindrance in a way that they could be to us. They have not stepped into our litigation and directly challenged us. So what happens in November realistically is pretty important to us. Yeah. It could be worse. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. One more question, sir, and then I'm done. I hear, of course, from the ag sector that there's more herbicide and fertilizer used on urban lawns and golf courses than all agriculture. Can that be true? Horse hockey. <laughs>
Uh, look at the size of our watershed and look at the amount of urban and suburban lawns <laughs> in our watershed. We have 10,000 square miles in the Raccoon and Des Moines River. Uh, no, there's no way that that's, that that's like saying I can walk through that wall. A physicist will tell you if you have the right molecular configuration, I can do that, but I ain't going to try it. Uh, it. It is absolute horse hockey. Thank you very much. Great to be in Pacific.